moving on uh, to our next section, which will be uh, moderated by Olaf Storbeck, who is banking correspondent here in Frankfurt with the Financial Times. Olaf, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we will be looking at the regulatory lessons to be learned from the financial crisis and the impact uh, from the COVID crisis and the impact uh, the pandemic has had and will have on the financial sector. Um, uh, we have a very distinguished panel and we'll start with uh, a keynote by a very busy man, Jörg Cookies, uh, Germany's State Secretary for Financial Markets in the Finance Ministry in Berlin. He's a former banker who made his career at Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, was at, at, at uh, the, the co-CEO in Germany before he joined uh, the German government in 2017 in a rare move from, from the banking industry to, uh, into, into policy making. Um, and um, I think you, as a student, you earned your, uh, some of your money as a cab driver, so you also have a first-hand experience uh, into one of the sectors which has been severely impacted by the by the pandemic. So, Jörg, um, the floor is yours. Yes, exactly. Hi, um, and uh, many thanks for this, and uh, apologies that I have to leave um, right after my keynote. Um, uh, there is one um, um, authority that has the ultimate sovereignty over my schedule, and that is the German parliament. And uh, um, whenever they call me for an urgent meeting, unfortunately, um, there is very little flexibility and scheduling. So, unfortunately, I can only stay um, until um, until about 10:25, but I'll try to uh, be brief and uh, go through the some of the key regulatory initiatives um, and uh, and try to explain how um, how COVID was actually a, a catalyst for a new era of financial regulation. And um, I think um, financial regulation was a key um, 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 element of response to the crisis um, when we saw what was happening. Um, of course, we received a lot of incoming um, 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 input from uh, from uh, companies, from uh, banks, from um, from uh, fund management companies on um, on the issues facing um, the real economy in this uh, pandemic. Um, and of course, the transmission channel um, between um, between uh, bank finance. Um, and the real economy was the key issue that we had because um, we know, of course, that if you don't address um, that lever and if uh, bank credit starts to dry up in a um, in a sharp downturn, as we saw in March, um, then you really come into very difficult second round effects. Um, and therefore, um, I really appreciate that uh, we got a lot of input um, during the uh, month of uh, March. Um, and were able to respond quite forcefully, um, both with um, economic incentives, i.e. guarantee programs, um, as well as with prudential um, rulemaking. And I think um, everyone who saw how quickly we responded um, with the so-called CRR quick fix, um, and that uh, really illustrated that, uh, that uh, giving uh, the banks the uh, relief um, um, for the capital that was built up um, in the good times to respond quickly um, in, the, um, in a, in a um, difficult situation. That uh, certainly helped things um, and uh, kept uh, the credit flowing and kept, uh, kept things alive. So in that sense, I think uh, that was a good, good first response. Um, we then, um, I think, uh, took very important steps, uh, both nationally and at the European level, um, to avoid pro-cyclicality that always goes with uh, rules such as the IFRS 9 framework. And uh, um, again, many thanks for the constructive input um, that both uh, the financial industry and the auditing profession gave us on that. Um, we certainly would have seen a, a pretty severe move towards stage two, three um, um, in the mar months of March, April, if we hadn't taken um, the, the measures to, um, to alleviate the strain from the system. And that certainly would have led to a lot more pro-cyclicality. So in that sense, I think those, uh, those two responses on the, um, on the um, uh, regulatory side were certainly uh, a big driver. Um, also, the fact that, uh, that, uh, that the big um, regulatory uh, measures were delayed and, and uh, the financial industry was given some more time, specifically on Basel III, I think, uh, was also an, an important step in the right direction. Um, on the other side, of course, the fact that we were very quick to move on guarantee programs, I think, uh, restored some confidence. So we both had the immediate impact 
um, of actual um, state guarantees providing um, um, for a um, continued flow of credit, um, but also, of course, the sign of confidence um, um, that uh, that the um, the governments were willing and able to react. I think that was also a an important signal to um, to market participants. Um, um, in Germany, of course, with the KFW programs, um, we've had some quite good success. We're at uh, 96,000 um, applications so far. Um, for uh, for a volume of um, 58 billion euros, um, that uh, uh, almost all of which are granted, by the way, um, 90,000 of them. So in that sense, that's a really quick and efficient transmission mechanism to keep the flow of credit um, alive um, and going. And um, I think quite a lot of the um, regulatory and supervisory um, facilitations that we took in the KFW program um, to, for example, allow the banks to book through um, any credit uh, below any loan below the value of three million directly to KFW without further um, checks. Um, the fact that we instigated something that probably um, a year ago people would have thought is completely impossible in a market economy, namely a 100% guarantee um, a program for uh, for some loans. Um, of course, with uh, with pricing that uh, gives the right incentives to use this program only as an sort of ultimate um, and uh, last re recourse, um, I think is important. Um, and we took quite a lot of measures, I think, to to facilitate that flow and to make it possible. So in that sense, um, we did what we could um, at the um, at the um, at the national level. Um, but um, I think what um, often gets um, um, underestimated. Um, is the fact that um, that uh, we also took um, a quite substantial action um, with the credit insurance industry, and that is an extremely important um, component of the European economy um, to keep um, the infrastructure and the pipes going. Um, and as the Commission told us uh, uh, when we launched our program in uh, April, it uh, served sort of as a as a carbon. Um, as a blueprint for several member states uh, to also um, um, come up with state guaranteed programs to keep um, the uh, the credit insurance uh, um, provision um, alive and uh, and running um, across Europe. So I think that was very important as well. Um, going forward, of course, uh, we are looking uh, to a lot of uh, innovation in um, in, uh, in regulatory initiatives. If you look at um, what we're doing now in the digital union, I think the question of how we um, make sure that a stable framework of regulation allows innovation, um, the, for example, in um, in digital currencies to um, to, um, to 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 help innovation, I think, is an extremely important topic. Um, we really are optimistic that the uh, markets in crypto asset um, regulation can um, propel Europe to the forefront. Um, in this sector, um, because we, if we're able to give consumers the confidence um, that this innovative um, type of payments can be um, can become mainstream, that could be a very interesting um, supplement to our systems. And uh, the fact that the European Union is moving ahead on this um, really shows that we're willing to um, to move forward on this. Um, nationally speaking, we are digitizing the bond market, so we're coming up with a um, new um, piece of legislation um, that um, that gives everyone the freedom, not the obligation. So if someone wants to, if any, anyone who wants to ignore the regulation can just continue as uh, as um, they're doing right now. Um, but we are creating an option to completely digitize and tokenize the German bond market, um, i.e. any kind of analogous uh, paper-based um, 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 issuing, trading, settlement, custody uh, will be eliminated on this track. Um, again, um, free choice, you can still continue the existing track, but anyone who wants to move ahead in the digital world of bond, um, of the bond value chain can do so with our new legislation that is upcoming. Um, so I think that's also, um, those are also, um, those are all extremely important um, points um, that uh, that we really want to be um, and become innovative and, uh, and technology facilitating in the way we set up our rules and regulations. Um, that uh, brings me over, of course, to the topic that uh, will also be an extremely important element of the response to the COVID crisis, namely how we deal with the Basel implementation. I think that's something where there is quite a lot of anxiety, both in the real economy and the financial industry. Um, um, and we've tried in a common position with the 
uh, French government to find a balance uh, between, on the one side, of course, staying true to our word and sticking to, um, to truthful implementation of the Basel Accord, but on the other side, also um, sticking and staying true to the ECOFIN and G20 commitments um, that the uh, Basel rule, the new Basel rules should not um, be a significant increase to capital um, that uh, would adversely affect uh, credit provision to the real economy. Uh, we're doing that, um, in our view, with a um, with a very um, um, solid and uh, and um, and um, and approach, uh, which is a version of the so-called parallel stack approach, where you essentially uh, take a look at uh, where the existing Basel rules are for uh, for um, uh, for the output floor effect, um, um, but on the other side, um, um, calculate the um, the output floor impact. Uh, specifically only for those part of the capital structure um, that, uh, that are Basel consensus. So in that sense, that uh, would um, mitigate the, um, the impact, um, but at the same time also um, um, adhere to the Basel goals. And at the same time, we, uh, we um, added in the opportunity or the possibility for supervisors um, to, um, to look at uh, the, the implementation at, um, at, um, um, on, in Pillar 2. So in that sense, I think that's a contribution to the discussion that we made with uh, with our friends and colleagues in France, and uh, hopefully that will be taken up. Um, but of course, uh, the Commission um, is uh, the master of the pro process uh, for the Basel implementation, and that's something that we will um, that we will see um, in the foreseeable future. So with that, many thanks, and um, again, apologies that I have to leave very soon. I can stay for about uh, three four minutes, but uh, really apologies, and I hope you have understanding that. Uh, someone from the finance ministry um, should be in parliament when parliament asks for uh, answers to questions. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, Jörg. Um, maybe a quick question on the Basel implementation, if I may. In, in which way has, has the government's attitude on this changed due to the pandemic? I mean, the, the, the discussion of the implementation was ongoing long before the pandemic. Do you think there will be material changes because of the lessons learned? And, and which w w what will it mean effectively? Will it mean kind of less audience stringent uh, rules? Uh, rules or? Well, I mean, our, our, discussion, our discussions with France um, um, on this actually predated the crisis. So I wouldn't say it's a direct impact of, uh, of the crisis. But of course, the, the question of um, how do we make sure that uh, the provision of credit um, to the real economy stays um, as it is or even grows, um, I think, um, has, of course, uh, become all the more important over the past months. And we do see how fragile this can be. Um, and of course, the other topic um, in, the, in the discussion that um, has become more important is the whole question of level playing field between the, uh, the economic regions of the world. And, uh, and of course, uh, I think Europe always has to, um, in a way, look out for itself um, and make sure that, uh, that when we um, make global agreements, we also take into account of the specificities of the European economy. And of course, as long as um, um, we are where we are, namely um, a predominance of credit provisions through the banking system, um, um, I think it's essential that we, that we remain pragmatic on this front. But at the same time, I think Europe can never um, go in the direction um, of, um, of ignoring, violating, or not truthfully implementing global standards. So I think that's exactly the balance that we have to strike here. And, uh, and the, the topic of sticking to global standards, I think, is, is an absolutely crucial one that we cannot deviate one inch from. All right. Thanks a lot. And I won't, don't want to hold you up further for your parliamentary um, statement. And um, thanks a lot. And uh, we now uh, start with the panel discussion. Thank I'm, you. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to be able to welcome a very distinguished panel of, of uh, policymakers and practitioners. Sometimes um, uh, people have been both. Um, so um, I'm, I'm happy to welcome Lorenzo Benis Maggi, uh, the current chairman of uh, Societe Generale, who, until 20 fr fr who from 25 to 2005 to 2011 uh, was the member of uh, the governing council of the uh, European Central Bank. Um, we have uh, Maria Nykänen, the um, board member of the Bank of Finland since 2017, 
She's dealing with financial market issues and macroprudential policy, and also as the chairman of, or the chairwoman, if I say, of the Board of Finnish um, Financial Supervisory Authority. And we have Christian Ossig, um, the co-CEO of uh, the German Association <coughs> of, ban of, of Banks and uh, a former investment banker. Um, I would like to start uh, with you, Maria. Um, I remember very well in, in, in March, April, we were all concerned and busy writing long articles about the, the potential uh, threat um, from the pandemic on, uh, on, on, on the financial system and the risk that this will basically trigger a new financial crisis. Um, uh, over the fast, uh, past few months, <coughs> bank shares have, have rebounded quite significantly and uh, banks seem to be out of the wood. Do you think we've seen the worst in the banking system or, or might there be more to come? I'm not sure if Maria can hear us. Um, we seem to have some kind of technical problems. Um, okay, um, maybe Christian, can, can you give us your view on this? Are, are the banks out of the wood or is there more to come uh, due to the pandemic? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can I be heard? Yeah, okay. Um, this is a crucial question right now. Um, our perspective is that banks are well prepared for the crisis and they have massively increased their capital. In fact, German banks have doubled their capital ratios over the last 10 years from below around about 9% to over 16% um, CT, CT1 ratios. Um, so I, I think banks are well prepared. However, as far as the second wave that we are entering is concerned, um, in, in German, you would say we are not over the hill yet. Um, what has worked well is that <clears throat> supervisors have enabled banks to use their capital buffers. Um, and in some cases that has worked well, in other cases that has not worked very well. The uncertainty that is out there right now is that we do not know what will be the damage done of this deterioration of the pandemic um, situation in terms of the situation on clients and with the credit losses of banks. Um, but um, as the situation is today, as we know, we are at a record low rate of insolvency in Germany. That's to, to a large extent artificial. Um, if you listen to observers such as Bundesbank, other central banks, the Global Financial Stability Report of the IMF, um, uh, supervisors testify to the banking system that um, the industry is well prepared. Um, and as I said, we are not out of the woods yet, um, but there are no signals at that stage that the banking system as a whole will not in a position to cope with the challenges ahead. Uh, Lorenzo, um, as, as Jörg pointed out in his, uh, in his keynote, um, regulators were quick to, to act in, in um, March and April, um, especially with regard to lifting uh, um, some, uh, some capital rules and, and some provision rules on, on, rules on, on loan loss provisions with regard to IFRS 9. Um, do you share the, the view that, that regulators overall did a good job or uh, what, what's your perspective on that, on, on regulatory action and the quality and, uh, of, of regulatory action we've seen <coughs> over the past months? Well, first, thank you for, for inviting me to this, uh, to this conference. Um, I, I would uh, try to... Um, to set some criteria, I mean, what what do we want uh, as um, or what what do the policy authorities uh, want? And I think uh, your cookies was was quite um, explicit in saying, first, uh, we don't want procyclicality, which is we want the banking system to continue to lend. At the same time, I would say uh, we want the financial system to be resilient is to be prepared, uh, uh, as, as Christian mentioned, in case of a second wave. So we have these two objectives, which are partly contradictory, because what you want is that uh, 
uh, the banking system in particular uh, looks carefully at its capital buffers because you know the worst may come and we have to be prepared for the worst so bankruptcies may increase so NPLs may increase and we have to have sufficient capital buffers on the other hand uh, if we want to support the economy uh, we have to use the capital to lend so this is partly contradictory now the decision by the policy authorities to put public guarantees on lending in the short term has helped to reconcile this apparent contradiction because banks have been able to lend without using too much capital now <clears throat> i think we have to to look at uh, all possible scenarios including the worst case let's let's suppose that we have really a very deep recession a second wave which is hard uh, due to the pandemic of course so this is a real economic crisis it's not a financial crisis and we have to ask ourselves is the banking system going to to be able to to absorb the shock and what if uh, there is a need to take a special measures now <clears throat> we have a lot of buffers but you know if 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 we go to the extreme what will be the solution well the the optimal solution is that the private sector comes in and if there is need for more capital is able to inject capital in the system that's what i think we should all be looking in a worst case scenario so we should ask ourselves are the policies that have been implemented such that it would encourage the private sector to come in if needed i'm not so sure that this will be needed generally but if needed in certain cases and this is the big question mark because i am afraid that in the current environment policy authorities are not focused on that they are not focused in on private sector they are may mainly focused on you know making sure that taxpayers money will not be used but that's not the issue the issue is how to make the banking sector investable for instance the prohibition to distribute dividends even small dividends even symbolic dividends is a measure which is scaring investors from entering the banking sector and there are other measures of this sort uncertainty about the future treatment of Basel uncertain which increase the cost of equity so I think if we want to attract the private sector to the banking system to help uh, uh, solve eventually some problems we have to make more clarity more regulatory certainty beyond what uh, your cookies have mentioned to make sure that the public sector can enter because to be frank, in a crisis like this one, the idea of resolving certain banks is in my view totally crazy. It would create a major, major problem. It would destroy value. So in a systemic crisis like this one, we really have to think about how to preserve value. Sorry if I'm too long, but um, this is, uh, I would say, a reaction uh, 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 to things that have been done, but we need to go even further to ensure that the private sector is able to cope with the crisis. Thanks. I'm not quite sure um, if we have a line to Maria at the moment. Apparently not. Can can somebody um, tell me what's going on there? Um, okay. So, um, there seems to be some kind of technical issue. So I will uh, just continue with the two of us, I'm afraid, at the moment, or with the three of us. Um, Christian, do you share how, how relevant is this dividend point which Lorendo just made? I mean, for the German banking system, at least when I'm looking at the listed German banks, um, Deutsche Bank suspended its dividend even long before the pandemic broke because they are in this uh, massive restructuring. Comets Bank was supposed to pay a token dividend which, which has been shelved. But is this an overall, from, from your overall perspective, is this a, a, a major issue in, in Germany and also uh, across Europe that this is basically scaring off uh, private investors and, and increasing uncertainty, making it harder for, the, for, for investors to basically be ready to put more money into, into the banking system? 
Yes, th thank you, Olaf, for the question. The question of distribution, dividends, which also includes share buybacks, that is of overriding importance for the banking industry in Europe as well as in Germany. Um, and let me start with one argument here. And Lorenzo pointed towards the increased cost of equity for banks that results from dividend restrictions. If banks hand out loans, if they give credit to the economy, um, and that is what everybody expects from the banking system right now, the cost of equity determines the hurdle rates at the price banks can hand out loans. So supervisors, policymakers have to be very clear that if a dividend restriction that, that is currently in place, or at least a recommendation, will be extended, that does hurt the cost of equity of banks, and with that, their ability, the pricing at which banks can hand out loans for the economy. I'm not saying by that that banks should be very careful in what no one wants here is that banks are handing out dividends and shortly after will turn towards policymakers for state aid. That is not what we are asking for. Banks always and will have to take a very careful approach to payouts. Um, and supervisors also, without the recommendation that the SSM has given out in place, supervisors have a lot of tools to influence and restrict payouts where they think it's not appropriate. However, a payout restriction through over the entire industry that is totally counterproductive. And by the way, your cookies also talked about the competitive situation of European banks. It puts European banks very much at a competitive disadvantage towards US banks or Swiss banks, where supervisors are much more flexible in allowing banks to pay out dividend, even in the current circumstances. And I say always paying out dividends with a very careful approach. Banks have been so far part of the solution. They have been really capable and standing despite this difficult situation alongside their clients. And if you look at the German market, the bulk of the funding that was handed out was actually not KFW state bank funding. It was liquidity funding that banks had on their balance sheet in order to carry on fulfilling that role also in the difficult second wave of the, of the pandemic, we need to look again at the, I like to call it the COVID toolbox. What are the measures supervisors have at hands in order to support the banking sector in this role? And restricting dividends is totally counterproductive in that regard. Um, and that is, irrespective of the fact that some of the larger banks have announced not to pay major dividends this as well as next year. I, I would like to kind of um, uh, challenge you a bit on this, uh, uh, both uh, Lorenzo and, and, and Jörg, because I, uh, in a way, I mean, it should be clear for investors in banks that if, you've, if, if, if an industry faces the most severe uh, economic crisis in in decades, pr probably in modern history. If you look at the GDP, uh, uh, the dro drops in GDP, how uh, how I mean, isn't it kind of absolutely natural that those investors uh, uh, have to anticipate in anticipate to take 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 their to to, to bear their sh share of the burden as well in ba ba in basically waiving um, a dividend at a situation where where loan loss provisions are expected to shoot up uh, significantly and and profit um, numbers are, are going to fall significantly. I mean, also, how would you explain this to the taxpayer that they that banks are basically paying their their investors while they are getting quite a lot of a big helping hand from uh, from the government? It just doesn't Sorry, be right. uh, uh, if I interrupt you, yeah. but banks are not have getting any help from the government. Well, I mean, we we talked about this relaxation in in regulatory standards extensively. This is uh, not a taxpayer. It's not a taxpayer. Uh, and we also burden. talked about the government-backed loans to the um, no, 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 the real economy, no, no. where uh, where the government I'm, I'm is sorry. Uh, where the government is no, taking. No, no. The, the government, the government is 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 providing support to those who receive the loan, not to the banks. Well, at least in Germany, the government is taking eighty, is, is carrying eighty to one hundred percent of the of the credit risk. So basically, yes, exactly. So if a company takes a loan, 
and does not repay it, it gets the guarantee from the government. So the guarantee from the government goes to the company, not to the bank. Okay, let's not get <clears throat> Actually, down, in uh, most cases, the bank has to take part of the risk. So I think it's a total misconception, total misconception of all the government guarantees. The government guarantees goes to the companies, not to the bank. The bank actually often has to pay. So the taxpayer, I mean, the banks have taken nothing from taxpayers during this crisis, zero. The, what, what is happening is that investors, those who invest in banks, which incidentally can invest in any other sector of the economy, technology, pharmaceutical, a car, have been stigmatized. So if you're investing in banks, you cannot receive dividend. If you invest in other sectors, you can receive a dividend. So people are rational, they will not invest in banks. And if people do not invest in banks, then if there is a real crisis and you will need private capital, then there will be no sufficient capital in the system to support the economy. So where will the capital come from? It will have to come from taxpayers. So we are adopting with this dividend ban. And as Christian said, it, it is a stigma because people, banks are not going to give a lot of dividend. But it is a signal that if you invest in banks, you're going to be hit. And therefore, people are going to invest in other sectors. And ultimately, the burden will be even greater on taxpayers. So it's a vicious circle, in my view. It's an unintended consequence of a measure which, it, which is uh, purely distortionary, I, I would say. But isn't the blanket ca ban on dividends kind of even stabilizing the system? Because without it, you would have faced not, not small banks it's, it's which were unable to, to pay dividends, which were uh, or, or, uh, struggling banks, which were then kind of stigmatized by the market, while, while stronger ones could still pay dividends. And that could, could lead to, to a downward spiral, doesn't, couldn't it? No, but you see, we had a rule. We had the MDA rule, so th there was already a system which indicated clearly to the markets which banks could pay dividends and which could not. In order to pay dividends and to pay bonuses to, um, to managers, you would have to be above the uh, MDA, which was called the MDA, uh, uh, for a certain amount. Now, uh, we changed the rule. Actually, we suspended the rule. There is no rule, so we don't know. We don't know uh, which uh, banks will be able to pay and which will not be able to pay. Uh, and so there is one additional uncertainty which is have been introduced in the banking sector, only in the banking sector. Second, the incentive is to accumulate capital because the idea is, well, maybe banks which have a higher capital ratio Will, uh, will be able to pay uh, uh, more, uh, more dividends. So the incentive for, for bank managers is to accumulate capital instead of lending. And if you look at the results of the third quarter of this year, is that in spite of the worst crisis for years, banks have increased the capital ratio. So it, it is paradoxical that you, uh, have uh, achieved a result which is the opposite of what you would like, as our cookies said, very procyclical. Banks are hoarding capital because they are protecting it uh, given the uncertainty that has been uh, uh, created in the system. In my view, that's not optimal for the economy. I would really like to get Maria's my, uh, opinion on this, but we still seem to have uh, technical problems. Um, would be would be nice to to get the regulators' uh, uh, view. Um, Christian, when when the when the pandemic broke, the banking industry and 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 and, and lobby groups were very quick to to basically flag concerns and and uh, about pro cyclicality pro rules and and other regulatory rules um, uh, that that. It ought to be relaxed. Some people said, "Well, th those pay the industry made the had ba had made these points uh, years in advance uh, of the pandemic, uh, but um, 
just use the opportunity to to basically hammer home the issue and 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 get some 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 ish some policy point out of the way that that it was taking issue with for a long very long time um what's your view on that was it just a good opportunity to 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 challenge some regulation Sorry, I was unmute. Um, let me quickly offer one last reflection on the question of payouts. And I want to really make sure that that's not misunderstood. I'm also chairman of the executive committee of the European Banking Federation. And when the SSM first in spring, I think it was around March, April, came out with a recommendation on dividend restrictions, we had with the SSM before the publication of the recommendation and ever since the publication of the recommendation, very intense discussions. And in spring, the reaction of the banking industry in Europe was that given the uncertainty we had in March, April, we said that the restrictions on dividends can be justified. What happened since March, April is that a lot of the uncertainty we had back then has been removed and we are deeply convinced that there is no need for a recommendation on European level for a blank dividend or payout restriction because, as I said, a lot of the uncertainty has gone and supervisors have got tools to restrict dividend payments by banks where they think it's appropriate. Plus, very important, uh, banks are not suicidal, right? You wouldn't see in the first place, even if we would leave it up to the banks, banks paying out large dividends if they would feel that their capital base is not sufficient enough. Um, and I think this kind of reflective approach by the industry, where were we in the beginning of the year, in March, April, where we are now, that has to be taken into account. We are not um, against kind of any payout um, caps um, under all circumstances, we are against a payout cap in a circumstance where we will think we, where we think we have much more visibility now, much more clarity on that issue. Um, to your question on procyclicality um, and other uh, changes in rules that we had seen um, throughout the year, and it, uh, we have to underline again, and your cookies related to that, it was a very strong signal by supervisors, policymakers and the industry, what happened at the beginning of the year, there was capital rules were adopted to a large extent, accounting rules were adopted, um, a lot of the effects on the RWA um, calculation um, that are pro-cyclical were taken out of the system. The moratorium rules are also elements of the whole pro-cyclicality debate. In Germany and other European countries, we have lowered the anti-cyclical capital buffer, um, and that was all very useful and were the right moves. However, there are also some things that have not worked. Um, and the, I, the principal idea that banks can use all their capital buffers um, if supervisors allow them to do so, that has not really worked because there is one variable in here and that is market participants. And if Super, if, if the markets know that banks have certain thresholds to fulfill, even if supervisors allow this are exceptional circumstances now, banks, because they fear discrimination, will not tap into some of these buffers. And that means that um, to some extent, this, the buffer system that we have in place has not proven entirely successful um, in, the, in the pandemic. And if at some point we look at the more structural lessons to be learned from the crisis for our regulatory system, the usage of buffers um, and how to enable banks really to use them, that is something that we need to revisit. Um, there are, I would think that there are lessons to be learned. There are certain weaknesses that the system now has proven. Um, however, and it has to be said very clearly and very loudly, there are also aspects that have worked extremely well and the fact that the banking system and i gave some numbers before has so strongly increased their capital ratios and that was to a large extent due by the revised regulatory system um, and that has proven successful that is something that has to be said is is very positive 
let me ask you a kind of a big picture question. If we, if we look at the, uh, well, uh, the recent history of financial regulation, from the after the financial crisis um, in 2008, 9, 10, uh, we, we had this kind of sea change of tighter and, and much more stringent financial regulation, which, which for a decade really uh, changed uh, uh, the, the whole landscape of, of re regulation within the banking industry. And, and, and there's more to come with regards to uh, implementing Basel III and, and things like that. Do you think that these kind of relaxation of rules um, uh, earlier this year in, in, in due to the pandemic is just kind of a temporary blip uh, which, which and, and this overarching trend will, will continue? Or uh, uh, is this a new inflection point uh, towards kind of lighter and, and, and a different type of regulation? Lorenzo, maybe your view on this yeah. uh, would be great. No, to, to, to be frank, I don't think that uh, personally myself uh, or, or the banking system is asking for a relaxation uh, uh, of, of the supervisory and regulatory standards. I think uh, what, what her cook has mentioned was a level playing field with the US and pragmatism. But if I can um, add on that, I think we, we are forgetting one element here of the uh, a financial system which is key for the adjustment of the uh, of the banking system and of the whole uh, industry is the capital market if you compare uh, the us with europe uh, what you've seen after the great financial crisis is a, a much faster recovery of the economy but also of the financial system because of the ability of um, the us capital market to absorb um, for instance, non-performing loans, uh, to, to distribute risk, uh, and to allow banks to get back to doing their business much earlier. In, in Europe, we don't have a capital market uh, which is as developed, and therefore it has been much more difficult to clean up balance sheets. It has been more difficult to recapitalize the banking system. It has been much more difficult to, to uh, uh, distribute uh, risk across the union. So um, what, uh, what we need to do, and I think the, um, the next generation EU is a great opportunity uh, uh, for, uh, on that, is to really adopt a series of measures which can be done quite quickly because, for instance, securitization is an area where Europe is behind. We have um, adopted uh, measures which were too restrictive uh, a few years ago, I think we need to rediscuss with an open mind um, this issue, and that would really help uh, uh, the private sector to absorb and to uh, support uh, uh, with private capital the recovery. We will be facing an environment where many companies will need to increase their capital. Uh, and where will they go if we don't have a strong capital market? The same for, for banks, which will need to sell the NPLs and so on and so forth. So if, if uh, uh, Hakukis was here, uh, I would ask him, uh, you know, going forward to the next European Council, the next ECOFIN, put all the effort in addition to the next generation EU to really a few measures that can make uh, the European system uh, uh, acting in a more efficient way. Christian, you mentioned kind of the redefinition or, or, or taking a different look at, at, at how to implement and how to, to work with those buffers. W what precisely do you have in mind? Should, should those buffers be kind of ab 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 abolished and, and, and put in a more kind of uh, uh, strict, implemented in a more strict way? Or how, wh wh what, what, what was your, what's the idea uh, behind this? It's very early days to really go into details on that debate because we are still very much in the middle of the crisis and to revise the buffer concept that will be work that needs to be done once we really have been through the pandemic and we really have a full um, full picture to analyze what works well what does not work well and also we have to say that the crisis that we are discussing here is not the banking crisis um, i've got some colleagues that always quite the churchill example and say um, and they look at the Basel Committee and then they say, um, you should never waste a good crisis for reform. Um, it has to be said that, um, yes, there is a crisis of the economy, but it's not 
a crisis of the banking system. And that means that the urge really to fundamentally revise the current pillars of, and this other, that, that essentially is the Basel work, to revise this broadly. Um, let, let's get really through the situation and then look at that. What can be said, and I don't want to avoid your question, what can be said at that stage already is that the usage of buffers has not worked perfectly well. Um, and Why some of the reasons what, here what is- What is the evidence for this? Um, because, uh, well, to take the, simply take some of the SREP buffers that the SSM um, has stated banks should use. And if you then look through the European Banking Super Universe, I think of the 130 or so SSM banks, only two really have under have gone below the capital and liquidity requirements that the ECB has asked them to fulfill. And, uh, and, and, and although the ECB then has enabled, allowed banks to go below these thresholds. So it, it's very clear that the usage of the buffer concept at the end of the day has not properly, property, properly worked. Um, it's also um, linked to the fact that there are too many automatic, automatic mechanisms in the system. Um, and, and, and that has also to do with core cyclicality um, where that has not properly worked well. So we need to, I, I think at the end of the crisis of this situation, we will revisit that. Um, I, I would also relate to two other points here that if we think about what other measures needed are very relevant for me. One is the Basel concept and the other one is the contribution to the single resolution fund. And we discussed before that supervisors have taken the stance that the funds dividends should pay should stay within the banks. Um, if we look at the banking levy, 9 billion paid this year, or the European banking industry is asked to pay 9 billion into the single resolution fund, up from a little over 7 billion last year. So tendency rising. And by the way, why is this banking levy rising so sharply? Um, it's rising because of ECB monetary policy that leads to an unexpected growth on deposits is totally unrelated to underlying risk in the banking system. To pay 9 billion in the single resolution fund takes 9 billion equity out of the banking system and harms ability to pay credit by the European industry by maybe around about 200 billion, huge numbers. Um, that is something that in my view should be reconsidered. Um, I stop here, but the implementation of Basel rules, this is something that your cookies um, also alluded to is maybe also something that we should raise in the discussion in a little moment. I would like to briefly discuss this point about pro-cyclicality pro uh, in, in a little, uh, um, uh, um, uh, little bit more deeply. Um, Lorenzo, um, do you think, wha wha what did we learn about pro-cyclicality in this crisis? Was this kind of a specific situation where, the, where, where the rules needed to be uh, tweaked? Or did we did, did did the pandemic basically um, show that the the rules were f were well flawed in uh, in themselves, regardless of the specific situation we were going through? No, you know, procyclicality is a very complex issue because it's inherent in human uh, in human nature. Um, um, now, this crisis uh, has made things more complicated because uh, of the uncertainty. Uh, we don't know how deep uh, is going to be the crisis and how long will be the crisis. I mean, ideally, if we want to avoid procyclicality uh, and, and to use the buffers uh, um, correctly, uh, the regulator should, should tell the banks uh, not only to use, I mean, the extent to which you can use uh, the buffer, but also when and what is the time frame in which the buffers will have to be reconstituted? Reconstituted. Now, if 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 you don't make a if you don't provide clarity on this, the attitude of banks will be to say, well, you know, I use the buffers. Then, what kind of risk do I face? Well, the first risk, as I mentioned, is the fact that you cannot distribute dividends. So, so you lend but you cannot uh, uh, remunerate your capital. Second is that given the experience of the previous years, you might be requested to rebuild your buffers much more quickly than you would able to do so. Uh, and this again 
adds to the cost of capital. So um, we live in an environment which is uh, uh, still highly uncertain, and we would need more guidance from the supervisor on on how it would work, uh, not only you know in the downside but in the upside. Uh, to 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 really have the contracyclical uh, uh, policies uh, operate efficiently. Okay. Um, let's address one topic, which is um, well, the elephant in the room when you talk about banking, the European banking system, which is cross-border consolidation. Um, and many people have for for long have said that that regulation is kind of um, hampering cross-border consolidation. Uh, you also said that we, um, or that Europe needs a more integrated financial uh, capital market and also more, more uh, a better viable banking system uh, um, to, to, to cope with, uh, with the future challenges and to, to compete at par with uh, US competition. Do you think that there are some lessons to be learned with regard to how regulators deal with consolidation from this crisis? And, and do you think the crisis will 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 foster and speed up uh, cross border consolidation uh, within Europe, or and should it be? Should I answer the uh, Should I have a go at the question, Olaf? Yeah, please. Um, so my simple answer is no. I don't see that the COVID situation will, by any means, accelerate cross border consolidation in Europe. And we see in some countries, notably in Spain, that it is, um, whether it's related to the COVID situation, I cannot be, um, I don't have a view on, but um, there, there is an increase in domestic consolidation as we see it um, right now in Spain. I don't expect, as I said, any impetus for cross-border consolidation. I would opposite is the case. Um, now, why do we see as little cross-border consolidation, although everybody agrees, that there is a great need for more pan-European banks um, and with that cross-border consolidation. Um, and my explanation for that is the economic rationale for cross-border consolidation is not very strong at that stage. And if policymakers um, are pushing banks to look at cross-border options, and the main reason why banks are not consolidating across border is because a lot of the economies of scale cannot be realized in a cross-border context. And it starts with the question of requirement for capital and liquidity, the so-called waiver decision. Um, if you are a pan-European bank and, um, and Lorenzo's bank uh, is active in several European countries, your ability to really re realize economies of scale because you can steer capital and liquidity requirements at good level. You do not have that. It is, um, as of today, it is a lot of national supervisors that will determine your capital and liquidity requirements. And you don't have the ability on group level to really steer that effectively. So if policymakers are asking and trying to encourage banks to uh, consider cross-border consolidation options, um, I would say the key is first in their hand because they need to adjust the framework and the question of capital liquidity waivers um, are at the forefront of the debate in order to really create conditions that will bring more consolidation about and without really touching that framework, um, we will not see many changes on that. It has to be said that the German presidency has tried to make that issue of capital liquidity waivers a priority and your cookies and his team they have worked hard on that on european level um it, the, the the obstacle here is the political and it's mainly the host countries um in the pandemic situation they much rather feel that the concept whereby host supervisors can determine capital liquidity requirements that has proven rather successful from their point of view so we are not closer in the wave of the pandemic of introducing capital liquidity wafers, we have moved, moved more, more away from this objective. Um, and it also has to be said that the ECB and Fernandez Boyo is um, driving that personally. 
is trying to simplify the supervisory process in a cross-border context. But that, as I said, has only to do with a supervisory process. The ECB has no power to attack the rules for capital and liquidity waivers that are underlying here. And in that regard, as welcome as the initiative by the ECB are to um, facilitate the supervisory process in the cross-border context, as long as we do not change the rules. And we will not see, um, and that is at least my perspective on that, we will not see large scale cross-border mergers. Lorenzo, what, what's your view um, on this? How is Societe Generale approach is thinking about this? No, no, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to, to mention Societe Generale, but there was a- That's a shame. If, if, if let me, let me, yeah, the, the demand for consolidation will be there in the sense that uh, with low interest rates for a very long time, with uh, higher NPLs, there will be some problem somewhere. Now, um, how do you solve these problems? And uh, <clears throat> I'm not want to be provocative, but uh, if we want to move the consolidation process, uh, and it's difficult to start from the host country, maybe it's good if we have a problem in the home, in a home country. And then the, uh, a home country bank would put the regulator the home regulator in face of uh, in front of a choice whether to accept foreign capital for this consolidation a, a, and point relieve the capital constraint that uh, the regulator is putting to use the liquidity and the capital also in other countries uh, <clears throat> i don't want to make reference to any specific country but uh, you know, in Europe, we make change when there is a crisis, and uh, and it's clear in my view that uh, uh, the uh, incentive initially is to do consolidation within countries. But uh, at a certain point, uh, the incentive for consolidation across countries will will start. We are seeing a wave of consolidation within countries in Spain, in Italy maybe at some point in Germany. But uh, uh, will this be sufficient to provide investors with adequate return on equity? That's the key point. And if this, the answer is no, at some point we will have to move to a further level. And of course, the, the regulator, the national regulator, and here home and host, uh, I think will have to, to work uh, and to, to provide the room and the incentive for uh, such a, a consolidation. But it is really in the hands of the, the national authorities which are preventing this. Um, and so they are making the European banking system weaker because of uh, some nationalism uh, in, in, in some respect and some uncertainty about what would happen if there is a crisis, if there is a resolution problem, what would a pan Europe, how would a pan European bank uh, deal with the capital and the liquidity i think these things can be sorted out and they need to be sorted out if we want a strong banking system in europe so you say it's basically a deliberate policy by national regulators to to not tr uh, to try to avoid having to host an international bank uh, and then to basically block uh, cross-border consolidation well, I mean, you know, for the German re uh, regulator is is putting restrictions on on using liquidity, uh, uh, German liquidity in uh, in in uh, say in Italy, for instance, for Unicredit. So we can talk about another bank, uh, and 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 uh, the Belgian regulator is putting restrictions on uh, on 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 capital uh, being uh, you know moved from Belgium to 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 France and. So, so each national regulator is still very keen in putting restrictions on cross-border uh, banks, the few cross-border banks that we have in Europe. And this is showing and giving an example to how it would be, uh, how, what would happen if we had a cross-border cross merger. So um, this means that there are these incentives, strong, strong disincentives to make such a moves 
unless the national regulators provide certainty about how, the, how a cross-border group, a pan-European group, could use liquidity and capital uh, efficiently uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in its day-to-day uh, -day operation, while, of course, in a case of a crisis, avoiding to, uh, you know, to, 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 to drive away capital from, from one country to another, so safeguarding uh, uh, some kind of uh, pan-European system, even in a crisis case. That, uh, that is the fear of the small countries. So, uh, I mean, G Germany has a very important role. Uh, I mean, it's, it's too bad that the presidency is ending in one month, but uh, clearly the fear of small countries in Europe is that uh, the large uh, uh, pan-European banking system would be based in the large countries. And when there is a crisis, they would, uh, you know, wipe out all the capital from the small countries. And, um, and, and the fear in Germany is that the liquidity uh, of uh, the German savers would be dispersed. Uh, so there is a lot of fear and uh, uh, we need to overcome this fear and, and create a sound regulatory framework which uh, would, uh, would help the creation of a true European banking system. Thank you very much. Time is up. Time was flying. I'm, I uh, thank you both for this uh, really fascinating <laughs> discussion. I have to apologize uh, that we weren't able to dial in uh, Maya. Um, uh, this, I think, shows kind of the pitfalls of, of, of these kind of digital conferences. Uh, it, um, but uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, a big thank you to both of you. And uh, I hand over to you for the next part of the conference.